All right, well, turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles today to John chapter uh, 6. We're going to use as our scripture passage today, John 6, 22, and, and uh, really uh, through the end of the chapter, let's say, that's a long passage, right? But uh, we're not necessarily going to you know, go line by line through it, but there's some things in there that I really wanted us to look at. Um, on the following day, when the people who were standing, John 6, 22, were standing on the other side of the sea, saw there was no other boat there uh, except the one which Jesus had entered, but then they saw, uh, and I'm just kind of paraphrasing here, then they saw that there were no other boats, etc., and when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into the boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. These people were sailing across the Sea of Galilee seeking out Jesus. They were sailing across the sea. They were following him, going everywhere that they knew he might be seeking him. You know, but Jesus, you know, he's no fool. He, he, uh, he, they come to him and they say to him, Rabbi, uh, when did you come here? And he answers them. Notice something. We often ask questions of God, and God knows that's not the real question in our hearts. And, and you know, people often throw up all sorts of smoke screens. When you go to uh, speak the gospel to somebody or you, you start to introduce Jesus into a conversation, they'll throw up all sorts of smoke screens. You know, well, where did Adam's uh, son's wife come from? Who cares? What's that got to do with your eternal salvation? You know, <laughs> you know, there, there's, there, there's so many smoke screens that people throw up. Rabbi, where did you come from? How did you get here? And Jesus answers them and says, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now, Jesus is referencing back here to a couple of days before, a day or so before when he had fed the 5,000 uh, in the wilderness, right? He's referencing back to that. and He's saying to them, you ate of this food. You know, it's kind of the same crowd is following him now. And he's saying, you ate of this food and you were filled. So, you know, it's kind of like, all of these reasons why people were following him and coming after him, seeking signs, seeking all sorts of things. You know, so uh, I, I want to ask us today, why did we come to Christ? What, what, what brought us? You know, many people come seeking healing. Many people come seeking, you know, financial things. Many people come seeking all sorts of things, sustenance, blessing, et cetera, et cetera, you name it. There's many, many reasons why people come to Jesus to begin with. But the bottom line is, once they've come, now they have to deal with the issue. They have to deal with the real issue. And that real issue is not the healing, it's not the finances, it's not the whatever, you know, heartbreak they're suffering from at that moment, right? The real issue is we are all sinners and need a Savior. If we come to Jesus for any other real reason, any other reason than that, at the very bottom line, at the heart of it, at the moment of salvation, that is the realization that we must have. That we are sinners and we need a Savior. Apart from that, you know, the, all of the external things are merely that, external things. What if you come to Jesus and he never heals you? Physically. Is he, ever le is he less God and are you less saved? No, of course not. He is God, period. And when you come to him and surrender your life to him and you accept his shed blood as, as the atonement for you and your sin, when you accept him as, as the price 
paid for you, at that moment, you are saved. And that's the end of it. You're saved. And all those external things, all the blessings, all the uh, sustenance, all the healing, all the miracles, all, the, all of those external things are irrelevant when it comes to heaven, when it comes to eternal life. You know, St. Peter is going to be sitting at the gates saying to you, well, you know, were you healed? Were you, you know, uh, did you tithe? Were you X, Y, A, B, C? Were you fill in the blank? He's not going to be doing that. First of all, St. Peter ain't going to be sitting at the gates anyhow. You can forget all, the, all that nonsense. But, it, you know, just for the analogy's sake, that's not what he's going to be asking. Right? He'll probably be asking the same question that Jesus asked Peter. Who do you say I am? Who do you say Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you? So people come to Jesus for all, all kinds of reasons. And, and, and so you look at this and Jesus is really saying to them, you're coming to me for selfish reasons. You want to be filled. You want to be, you know, lifted up. You want this. You want that. Why do you come to church? I sure you, you come, you want to be encouraged, et cetera, et cetera. But you know what? So what about your encouragement? So what? You're not here to be encouraged. You're here to worship God. You're here to, to uh, honor Him, to worship Him. That's different. That's different. We have, you know, multiple mega churches all over the county. If you want to feel good, go there. You know, they'll make you feel good. They'll never mention sin. They'll never, you know, uh, uh, you know really hit the crux of the matter in that regard. Because they don't want to mention that word in their service. I got to tell you, if we don't mention that word in our service, we might as well not mention Jesus either. Because the only reason to come to him, the only lasting true confession is I'm a sinner and I accept the blood of Jesus. I accept his crucifixion, his resurrection as atonement. His blood is my, my atonement. Notice then, Jesus says to them, most assuredly, you, you seek me for the signs, for being filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures the everlasting life. You know, we spend so much time. How much of our time do we spend at work? You know, I, I work 50 hours a week most weeks. Somewhere in that neighborhood most weeks, that's a lot of hours. It's a lot of time. It's a full, what, third of our lives or more that we spend at work laboring for the food that perishes, you know, the things that perish, you know, the nice house, the, the dinner, the, you know, the clothing, the whatever else is, they perish. Yet that seems to be the driving, consuming force, isn't it? Now, our Father knows we need these things. He's not... You know, obviously not ignorant of what it means to be human and, and what it means to live in this world and what we have to do. But don't labor for that food. Labor for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. And notice what they say to him. Now listen, again, you see, they're looking at the natural. You know, they were, they were with Jesus in the wilderness, and he fed them. They were happy about that. Now, what do they say? Master, Rabbi, what, what do we have to do to work the works of God? That sounds like a good question, except that you hear the emphasis in it. What do we have to do? 
What must I do? Now, you know, in some ways it's good to say, what must I do to be saved? But that's not what they're asking. They're saying, what must I do to be worthy? What works must I do to be worthy of the kingdom? That's what they're asking. And we've got to be careful as Christians that, that we don't set our sights upon our own deeds and our own works. What must I do to find the, the favor of God? Must I attend church every Sunday? Well, as your pastor, I'm going to tell you, yes, that's on the list. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's not on the list. It's not on the list. Do I believe you should attend church? Absolutely. Do I, and there are many biblical, scriptural reasons why. However, however, not attending church will never keep you out of heaven. Right? That's right. That's right. What about tithing? Should you tithe? Oh, that's a sticky subject with a lot of people, but the answer is yes. I know many believers who say, oh, no, that was Old Testament. <laughs> yeah. And we're not under the law. All that is is somebody trying to keep their money and not give it to the Lord. That's all that is. Now, listen, I'm not, this ain't a message about tithing. Will, will failing to tithe keep you out of heaven? No! Yeah. It won't keep you out of heaven. You know? Uh, so what are the works we should do? What are the works we should do, they, they asked him. You know, they're expecting some grand answer. Like, go do this, go do that. You have to you know, you know, all those things that we got oh, struggle to do. That's what they're expecting. And what does he say? You read it. What does he say? This is the work of God. You believe on him. God has sent. Believe. See, that's different. That's different. Believe. That's the work of God. Have faith. It, it's, let me tell you, when you're struggling in a certain area, whatever that area is, it's hard to trust God for that. That's the work part is believing and trusting God for your health. Believing and trusting God for your finances. Believing and trusting God for whatever that circumstance or situation is. That's the work. Faith. Having faith. Believing Him. You know, Scripture says uh, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Right? So often we jump right to our own works. There's a, a, a problem. Well, I can solve that. Well, now, I'm not saying you shouldn't solve your problem. Solve your problem if you can. But so often we solve our problems without asking God. And we end up with a different solution than what God would have perhaps desired for us. And I can promise you our solution, though it may work, is never as good as God's solution. <laughs> it never is. <laughs> It is. It is. <laughs> so what shall we do to be acceptable to God? Believe. 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 Listen, I'm sorry. I don't care what you've done in your life. And I don't care what horrible thing you might do yet in your life. God forbid. We don't want that. Uh, but you understand what I'm saying. We all make mistakes. We all sin. We all make mistakes. We all sin. But if we believe him, we repent of our sin, we turn to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Not only that, what he does, 
you know, we, we said about that blood being the atonement. What he does, he washes us in that blood. And, that, and the Bible says if, if, we, if we confess our sin, 1 John 1, 9. 1, 9, thank you. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and, and cleanse us. From all unrighteousness. That's, that's, that's the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us, washing out that unrighteousness. Though we sin, nor our sins are, are many, will be as white as snow by the blood of Jesus Christ. Only by that blood. By nothing else. Only by that blood. Not by my works. What works shall I do? Believe. Only believe. If we can just understand that, just get that down. Believe. What work shall I do? Our faith, according to James, has good works inherent in it. As we develop and grow in our faith, we'll do the right things. Because we'll want to please God. Because we'll be walking with Him. Because we'll be living in Him walking in the Holy Spirit and listening to His voice, following His guidance. When we're about to make a mistake, He'll check us. I'm not talking about a hockey check either. <laughs> it's different. A different kind of check. <laughs> uh, some of us might need lightning. <laughs> he might give you a strong check sometimes. What shall we do to be acceptable to God? Believe. Believe. See, Jesus refocused them away from themselves, away from their own works, away from what they could do to what only he could do. He told them, believe. He said to them, or they said to him, "What? listen, after all that, after, listen, these are the same folks that saw him the day before feed 5,000 people with a few loaves and fishes or whatever. And, and those same people now are saying to him, well, what, what will you do? You know, I, I hear such a, uh, an arrogant or, or impudent uh, tone. You know, what will you do? What sign will you do that we should believe you? After all, that was yesterday you fed 5,000 men with a few loaves and fishes. What will you do today? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Think about that. Just think about that once. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was pretty good, but, you know, uh, a few loaves and fishes. Why don't you turn a couple of them fishes into, you know, big old uh, oxen and, and, and cook them up for us, you know? Today we want steak and eggs, you know, and <laughs> not just fish and loaves. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I always got a kick out of that line. Well, what work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert. And as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they're, they're saying to Jesus, you know, hey, Moses, you know, gave our, fed our fathers manna, Right? So who are you? What are you going to do? And Jesus, you know, again, he's trying to refocus them. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father. Now notice, he calls God his father. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Give us this bread always. And Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. Now that's the, the first of his seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. That's the first one. I am the bread of life. Now, of course, in saying I am, he's referencing back to Moses. They brought Moses into it, right? Moses gave our fathers manna in the desert. Jesus is referencing back to Moses experience at the burning bush he says I am the bread of life he says anyone that eats this bread 
will, will never, you know, hunger again. Anyone that eats of, of this bread will never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. That's the same thing he told the woman at the well uh, uh, back there a little bit ago. Just a couple of days before. He talked to a woman at a well. Turn over to John 4. He turned over. He, he talked to a woman at a well. And, and, and you know the circumstance. You know, Jesus went through Samaria and, and uh, he stopped at Jacob's well. That's a pretty well-known well. You know, today, 2,000 years later, what do we say? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. Right? So, you know, it's a pretty well-known well. Jacob's a pretty well-known guy amongst the Jewish people. And even today, 2,000 years later. And the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask a drink? Uh, Jesus asked her for a drink of water. From me, a Samaritan woman. For you, for you Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan. Jesus is, is showing forth here that there is no... Samaritans were... Literally called dogs by the, by the Jewish people of Jesus' day. They were called, literally called dogs. And the word Gentile, you know, actually means dog, right? So, but the, 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 the Samaritans were about as looked down a, a people group as you could ever uh, see. And Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God... Who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. See, Jesus takes, is, is trying to take everything from the natural and from our focus on the natural and from our focus on what we have to do or can do to be acceptable to him. And he's moving that focus and shifting it to faith and to what, what um, uh, belief and to the supernatural to the kingdom, to heaven, to eternal life, not this life. This life is, it is what it is, you know. And don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, I love my family. I love my life. I love to preach the gospel. I, you know, I, I, I love the work that I do. I love all the, all the you know, things of life. I, I do love them. But you know what? I love the kingdom more. And, uh, you know, uh, the Bible says, don't be afraid of, of those who, you know, can take your life, you know, because they can't really take your life. If you've accepted Christ, then you have eternal life. It is yours. It's already started. Don't look forward to eternal life. You're in it. Amen. You're in it. You're in it now. It started the day you accepted Jesus Christ. You entered into eternal life. You entered into it right then. It's not like we got to look forward to heaven. For God's sake, please tell me you're not worried about whether or not you're going to heaven. If you are, we need to get you saved. If you're worried about that, you need to be saved. If you're worried about why go to heaven, you need saved. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you're worried about am I going to heaven, look, if I drop dead right now, please tell me you Take appropriate care of me. But if I drop that right here, right now, I'm going to heaven. I make out. In the end, I make out okay. You might miss me a little, but you'll get by. You'll get by. <laughs> you know? But I make out okay. I don't fear any man. I don't fear the things of this life. There is no fear. Fear isn't, you know, forget that nonsense. Because they, they can't kill me. You can't kill me. It doesn't matter what they do. They can't kill me. Take this life, I'll be with him in the next. You know, I make out. <laughs> in the long run, I make out. Believe in him who sent. Jesus moves this conversation with this witness, uh, this woman, excuse me, from the well, from the natural to the spiritual, from getting a drink to the spiritual drink, right? 
and, and, and he talks of, to her of everlasting life. But notice on down the line here a little bit, he, he tells this woman, go call your husband and come here. And a woman says, well, you know, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you, you have well said, you have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband. In that you, in that you spoke truly. And, and the woman says, well, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Well, yeah, no kidding. I think, you know, yeah, okay, pretty perceptive. You know, but here, here's the deal. Here, here's the deal. What, what was that all about? Jesus was using a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge about this woman's sin, the life that she has led. Okay, he's bringing that to her attention so that he can, it's like holding up a mirror. And you can look in the mirror and see yourself. And, that, you know, for now we see in the glass darkly. This is a mirror. You know, don't try to read it upside down. You might not get much from it. But, you know, look in the mirror. When we read God's Word, why should Christians read the Word of God? Because when we read God's Word, it's like beholding our, our soul in a mirror. And we see, and we, we see his words, and we hear his words, and we, we come to know our own soul. Behold, I see in a glass darkly. The Bible tells us in uh, Hebrews, I think, it's, I think it's 417, I might be wrong on that, Hebrews somewhere, you look it up. For the word of God is quick. What's that mean? Quick. Alive. Living. Living. It's quick. It's, yeah, timely. Quick. It's alive. For, for, for God shall quicken your mortal body. For his book is alive. That word is alive. And when we read it, it takes root in us and grows. That's why Christians should read the word of God. For the word of God is quick. It's alive. It, it is more powerful than any two-edged sword dividing asunder bone and marrow, soul and spirit. In other words, it, it, it has the ability to cut to the very chase, to the very uh, uh, quick, to the very depth of our soul and reveal ourselves to ourselves. Because, boy, I know sometimes when I'm doing something wrong or thinking something wrong or I have some you know, foolish thought in my head. I know it's wrong, and yet I can justify it just as quickly as I can think it. Right? But the Word of God has the ability to cut through that, get to the depth and the core of that matter. That's why Christians ought to read the Bible. Because it's alive, it's quick, it's powerful. And it has the ability to, to lay aside uh, a cut soul from spirit. In other words, you know what your soul is, right? It's your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. That's your soul. And that wars against the spirit, right? That wars against your spirit. So often your spirit, man, wants to do what's right and your soul is making all kinds of excuses and trying to push you in another direction. The Word of God can overcome that. But we have to partake of that Word. You can't partake of the Word of God watching something else on TV. You can't partake of the Word of God you know, without opening it and reading it and studying it can't partake of the word of God without loving it. Of course, in this passage with the woman, he, he announces uh, her, himself to her as the Messiah. And interestingly enough, he, he pronounces this Samaritan woman the, the first evangelist. Right? One of the first evangelists, I guess I should say, 
tells her, go, go, you know, get your husband. But then what does she do? She runs out and gets the whole town. You know, she runs out and gathers the whole town, brings them, brings them to see Jesus. You know, <laughs> yes, God, do it, do it right. You know, some verses, uh, we already looked at verses 30 to 35, really, didn't we? Where Jesus, uh, uh, back here in John chapter 6, where Jesus announces that he is the uh, bread of life. He announces that manna was temporary. Jesus' life is eternal. The moment we believe, we enter into that eternal life. Here Jesus reasserts this claim about three times in this passage. Verse 35, he says, I am the, the, the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And verse 48. Drop down there. Again, he goes back to Moses. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. <laughs> Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they are dead. Let me tell you something. Many people come to Jesus Christ for a miracle. They get their miracle and they're dead. And they walk away. I've seen it over and over and over. We had a woman... In the early years of our church, who was her child was healed of a brain uh, tumor. Not not in the church, but uh, actually outside of the church. But her, you know, her child was healed of the brain tumor. She never would come and, and give any honor or glory to God or even thank you know really thank the Lord for that that miracle of healing. Unbelievable! I couldn't believe it. I was just flabbergasted that someone would receive such a miracle and then end up just kind of denying that, pushing God away and not, yeah, yeah, amazing, just amazing. Jesus reasserted that claim again in verse uh, 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ain't man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. And then in verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. And the bread that I give you is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? You know, isn't that what, what we do as human beings? We nitpick and, and, and yeah, miss the whole point because we try to nitpick everything. Jesus says, my flesh, I give my flesh to the, you know, for the life of man. And they're going, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Not understanding or not, not seeing the, that which is qu coming. They quarrel among themselves. And Jesus goes on. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, this is obviously an allusion to um, uh, communion. Obviously, you know, it's, a, it's an allusion to that. But it's so much more. So much more. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up. At the last day. For my flesh is food indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood. Abides in me and I in him. As the living father sent me. And I live because of the father. So he who feeds on me. Will live because of me. This is the bread. Which came down from heaven. Not of your fathers ate manna and are dead. He who eats this bread. Will live. Forever. Now jump on over with me, if you would, to Romans chapter, or go to Second Peter. Jump on over to Second Peter. Second Peter one. This is the. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have 
who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He might have been writing that right to you and me. Right to you and me. 2,000 years in the making. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How many things has he given us? All things. Everybody say, all things. What's missing? Nothing. He hasn't, he hasn't withheld anything pertaining to life and godliness. All things he's freely given us. Freely given. All things. He's given us, his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given, by, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. We have a better covenant than our forefathers, a better covenant than Abraham. That, th that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You can be a partaker of God's divine nature. When you accept Jesus Christ, you partake of the divine nature. That, that passage about the bread of life didn't just refer to communion. It referred to so much more. The actual acceptance of Christ. The actual uh, uh, knowing of him and his love and his mercy, his grace in our lives. Now flip on over if you will. We partake of his divine nature to Romans chapter 3. We partake of his divine nature. In him is life. There's no darkness at all. We partake of that life, that light. We partake of that light. In him is life. In him is peace. In him is joy. In him is faith. In him is hope. In him. We freely partake of these things. You know? Freely partake. Of these things. Romans the third chapter. Look over at verse 21. We're going to close with, with this passage. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. You remember how the, the, uh, the people who were talking to Jesus. They were looking, they were looking for how do, how do I do the works of God? What must I do? What works must I do? And here God, God is saying to us, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Apart from what you must do or what you can do. You do realize that even, even Mother Teresa would have gone to hell apart from Jesus. If she did all the good work she did without the knowledge of God, without loving Christ, without accepting him, she'd have been a good person in hell. You think of the best person you know if they don't know Christ. Their end is hot. Best person you know. You don't know Christ. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God is revealed, being written by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. The righteousness of Jesus Christ for all who believe. For all who believe. Is Jesus Christ righteous? Does he pass the standard for St. Peter at the gate? Is he going to make it? Yeah. <laughs> and that righteousness belongs to you. It's on you. It's in you. By the blood of Jesus Christ. For there is no difference. Listen. 
For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned and come short of his glory. We fail. Go online and take the entrance into heaven exam. You fail. If you're not relying on the blood of Jesus Christ, anything else is an F. Only the blood of Jesus Christ. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood. Let's, let's take one minute there. That's an interesting word, propitiation. It's a controversial word nowadays. Many, many people say, oh, you know, uh, Jesus, you know, didn't really have to die on the cross. Because, you know, God is love. And after all, loving God would never send anybody to hell. Right? No. The Bible tells us Jesus was given as a propitiation for us. What's that mean, propitiation? Literally, that means to satisfy the wrath to satisfy divine wrath by a sacrifice. That's what that word means, propitiation. It's someone else paying the penalty for you. They could be your propitiation. If you're in court and the judge says you're guilty, lock him up, right? And someone jumps up and says, Judge, you know, uh, I'll, I'll go to jail and let him go free. And the judge accepts it, that deal. That man would be your propitiation. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did. We deserve punishment and hell for all have sinned and, and fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus Christ is our propitiation by his Blood, by his blood. The Old Testament tells us that, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Why do you think God slayed an animal in the garden when Adam fell? He shed that animal's blood for the propitiation, for the uh, uh, remission of sin. Yeah. He loved Adam more than the animal. He loved man more than the animal. We got it all backwards. We think that, that man was created for the world. God created the world for man, not vice versa. We're having a warm winter, and I'm enjoying it. Thank God for global warming. <laughs> Did I go too far? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, but, you know, it's true. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I am enjoying a warm winter. Low, low, low heating bills. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Propitiation for our sin by his blood. Listen, through faith. To demonstrate his righteousness. It was an, a demonstration of the righteousness of of Christ, a demonstration of it, his act of sacrifice on the cross. It was a demonstration of his righteousness. Let me tell you, think about that for a minute. It is a demonstration of his righteousness. Would you go willingly? <laughs> or would you have to be dragged kicking and screaming? Yeah. It's a demonstration of his righteousness. Absolutely. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Listen, 
You keep your faith in Jesus. Don't keep your faith in your own works and your own goodness. Don't put your faith in and trust in the government. Don't put your faith and trust in your employer or anybody else. You keep your faith in God. Keep it in Christ Jesus. And he is your justifier. He is your righteousness. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your word today. Lord, we love you. We bless you. We glorify you today. We ask in Jesus' name that you would teach us to love you more. Teach us to love you more than the world. Teach us to love you more than ourselves. Teach us to love you more than mother, father, aunt, and uncle, brother, sister, son, and daughter. Teach us to love you more. Father, we love you. Worship you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You go with God today. Remember, he is your propitiation.